thank you for to the people of Tenende and the Keicho territory for being here on your homelands once again. We have such important meetings like this over the years on your homelands, and uh, I, uh, I'm always so grateful for that. Um, and I also want to say also that I want to, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, Colleen and Marin and all these young women in such good positions with their passion, uh, in particular, in particularly on this issue. Thank you for asking me to present here today. Masi Cho. I am people of the lakes, um, a place more beautiful than I could ever describe, but it's in my heart and in my soul. And um, it's a place where my grandfather packed me on his back many, many miles over many rivers and lakes and streams, and a place where thousands of caribou, the Porcupine River caribou herd, come our way, and they um, come through our camps. And the pregnant cows would sleep all over the lakes, and it's, it's real quiet time in our camps. Nobody makes too much noise when the cows are sleeping out there because they're pregnant and they have to go such long ways to have their young ones in northeastern Alaska at the Arctic coast. And it's a place where many different birds come from, had come from all over the world to bless our homelands, where they build their nests. They work so hard. I watched them since I was a little girl. They build their nests and they fly around all over the place and sometimes they would give us eggs. I'd go and steal a couple of eggs over the years. And uh, then they bear their young. And, um, and then in the creeks, I would make a willow net and I'd get fish for our dogs in the little creeks between the lakes. And how special this place is. This is uh, what we call affectionately crow flats. And uh, there's thousands of lakes there. It's now known, I guess, since then, one of North America's biggest wetlands. And uh, I just want to tell you a little story about my grandfather. When it's time for the birds to come, my grandfather and I, he'd take me to this one special lake, Vivain Joe, it's called, High Bank Lake. We'd go there, and all the birds would come and land there from our, their long trip from wherever they come from. And... Um, We'd go there and uh, we'd do that every year. And we watch them greet each other, we watch them tease each other, we watch them play out on the lakes and they sing their songs. The first ones to come would be the swan, da rai. The geese would be the khe. The little duck, the one, the only one that could knock down the swan was da rai ga kha. And the loons, tsarvit. And teve um, tsil, those little shore birds that I now see and I see over the years now in Honolulu and Hawaii and places like that. And uh, my grandfather would name them as they're flying in and they're landing. And, uh, and his, in his last years, I was about 10 to 12 years old and we're sitting at that same place and he said, you know, it was just quiet and we're watching this and he said, when you're a woman, big change gonna come. Yento go ahead, tree. Things are going to change big time, and they're gonna, we're going to have hard times. And they're, you're going to see only two loons there. And um, so I had that in my mind all the years in my life, and as I go to Crow Flats and see the changes. In the 1960s, the oil and gas exploration took a big D8 cat train and went through many areas on the wetlands in the, amongst the lakes. And I watched things that happen. And in those the trails of the cat train, there was always lots of water and it just kept melting and melting and melting over the years. And um, I take my children there now all the time as well. And in 2005 was my mom's last time there. And uh, we went there and she said, no matter how much our land change, you guys gotta come back here all the time. Bring your children here because it brings we're going to come alive then, meaning their spirits will come alive, and they will be with us again, and the land will come alive. So we continue to go there all the time. And in 2007, one of our biggest lakes, the Zelma Lake, the biggest lake that we do get everything, fish, muskrats, beavers, ducks, everything just drained away suddenly, gone, disappeared. And it looks exactly like that 
dry desert, that Zelma Lake that I'm standing on right now. And, uh, and with it went all our food. And when we talk about food security, I mean, uh, when we talk about all these permafrost melt, it means our food. And the number one sustenance of all the people in the Arctic is our food. And with this goes all this change, with it goes our food. And makes us become very in food insecure. So now it's uh, real sad sometimes to walk over our homelands and see such devastation where the banks are, shores are falling in. Water cover all the trails, the little trails, caribou trails and ancestral trails that we used to walk on together. Me and my mom would carry traps and set traps all around the lakes. It's just full of water now. You can't walk there anymore. And it smells bad. And willows growing everywhere. It, and uh, everything tastes so different. Muskrats taste different. We don't eat the ducks anymore that come there. And uh, we're we're still really happy to see some birds come along though and we still our caribou still roam our land so we're very happy about that and um our ways our culture are the ways we work the land the way where we work the animals all change as well we we can no longer travel on the ice as we used to we also can't have ice cellars we can't just dig in the ground and store our food until we go back to town we can't do that anymore because we can't have ice cellar. So we got to dry our food immediately as soon as we get it indoors. And things, things really change. Um, and my partner, Tuki Mercury, um, he's from this area, Acacho territory. He was one of the best filmmakers in the Arctic. And um, he always had a camera with him. And uh, over a 20 year period, he shot our life, life on the land. And, uh, and when my mother was still alive as well. And uh, so we, we started collecting footage and, and thank heavens in 2010, we got some money from Health Canada and Adaptation Program to, put, to produce the film along with a research study that took place on food security in my community. And the narrator in it is Yudi Mercury, who is my son as well. It's a whole family thing out on the land. Of course, it's all my family out there living on the land. And uh, so through this funding, we're able to put this film together. And uh, so we're really happy to show that to you today, to feature that here. And I hope you like it. And it's called Our Changing Homelands, Our Changing Lives. Merci. We were the people of the lakes. We hunt together. We work together. We hunt together. And we pray together. We pray together. The land is our home. And we pray together. The land is our home. Here in the northern Yukon, the land has been for thousands of years. The land has kept us for thousands of years, but something is happening to our home. But something is happening to our home. My name is Yudi Mercury. 
I am Vantek Bajin. My name is Yudi Mercury. I want to share with you what is happening to our homeland. I am Vantek Bajin. I want to share with you what is happening to our homeland here in the Yukon's Arctic. Every year, my family goes north to Old Crow Flats to hunt, fish, for and gather traditional foods from the land. It is the second largest wetland in we have been North coming America here for generations. The pyramids were built. It is the second largest time, wetland in North America from before the pyramids land. were built. From the times that mammoths and giant beavers still roam the land. Our playground, our church. This is our bank, our grocery store, our playground, on the ways our church. Surviving in this land from generation to generation. We have passed on the ways of surviving in this land from generation to generation. I remember when I was a child, my mom would take me everywhere with her. I was always on her I back. remember when I was a she child, was carrying me with my mom would take me everywhere with her. I was always on her back. Or sometimes she was carrying me with a baby strap and a blanket. And, blanket. And, and leave me there for there a are some times that I remember where she plopped me on the ground listen, and leave me there for a long time while she was picking berries. And, plants. and, and I, I would listen, I'd I stare up at the sky and look at the trees around me and the plants. Um, and I could hear everything. I could hear their voices, and I, the I mothers talking um, in our language. And I could hear the birds singing and I, I could see everything. I found that that's really important to teach my child too. I found that that's really important little, to teach my child too. And then I put him down on the ground. So Ever since he, he was little, I took him out to the land and can become put him down on the ground the land. so that he can be quiet and he can feel and he can become connected to the land. I found that really, really helped him a lot to be able to. Um, open I found that really listen and to really share helped him a lot to be able to around him um, open him up to listen and to hear what's, that are what's going on it's so around him. To listen to those the silence and, of nature um, or the animals that are really around. Really it's so important to, to listen to those things, too. and um, I think that's I'll very, very important to teach. My grandmother used to talk to the ravens and talk and read the land and the water in May. Early in the morning, before we'd get up, she'd step out of the tent to come by in May, and then she'd, she'd stand there and wait to them the gym for the ravens to come by, and she'd ask them, and then she'd lift her hands up and talk to them at the gym. When are they coming? She'd ask them, "Where are the caribou?" I'll give you the caribou eye. When are they coming? And I'd always know when she'd come back. If you let me know, I'll give you the caribou eye. What the ravens had said. And I'd always know when she'd come back with a sad there look on her face. That one time, what the ravens had said. At one time when she'd come in and she'd say. But there was always that ready. one time. Because the carry were coming. At one time when she'd come in and she'd say. There's a lot to learn at camp. Because the carry were, we're coming. We were taught from a very young age how to skin animals. There's a lot to learn at camp. How to prepare drying rats. We were taught from a very young age how, how to, to skin animals. Meat. How to prepare drying racks. And to honor our ancestors. How to dry meat. We know about and to honor our land. ancestors. And remembering the past that the land will care for we us. We know by caring for the land and remembering the past that the land will care for us. In the Gwich'in culture, we give thanks to the caribou that come our In way. In the Gwich'in culture, lives for us to we give thanks to the caribou that come our way and then gave us and their that's what I'm here to do us right to now eat and, and, uh, and stuff to say thanks and to all the I'm animals that do came right our now way and, and, and uh, stay on, the, on their land and stuff to say thanks to all the animals so that came our way and let us stay on, the, on their land and stuff so the land has provided us for thousands of years the land has provided us for thousands of years. What it will bring or when. But it's not always certain what it will bring or when. Well, it's May 21st, and it's been four days since we've seen caribou. And well, we have it's no May 21st. Camping. And it's been four it's days since we've seen, we seen caribou. And we have no meat in camp, and pretty soon. 
kind of weird that we have. So we haven't just seen Carrie for the last the couple days because they should be coming meet, pretty soon. Meet rack for, uh, so I'm just getting ready here on this pole and, uh, to make a meat meat rack so for, for uh, my mom. We saw nine caribou about 15 and, kilometers uh, away at my uncle's cabin there. So my, and my we one saw of the nine caribou about 15 kilometers Katie, away at my uncle's and, uh, cabin going, there. And my, one of the guys went and checked it out with her cousin Kibby, and uh, they're going, they're going. He might go camp there at their camp for a bit. So we'll see what happens. They're gonna be gone, and he'll shoot at the creek over here if they get any caribou, and then we'll go over there and harvest it up and bring it back here and cook some fry meat. I think the caribou season has started. The first herd just came in and uh, my brother and his friend just went out there to go check it out. They're going to hunt and see if they can get a couple. So uh, we're just going to wait and see what happens. Because right now there's a lot of them. We'll see. heard one gunshot so it was sounded like he hit it. Our people are very closely connected to the land. Our life and culture are based on the porcupine caribou herd. It is the source of our food, our teaching, our traditional tools and clothing. We know when it is healthy and we know when it is not. And lately, our elders, our hunters, have seen disturbing changes. Caribou, they start coming through here, mid-May, middle of May. They uh, migrate to north. And, uh, usually it lasts for about three weeks. Migration through crow flats, but last lately, the last few years, it's been getting short, and uh, caribou are all mixed up now. It's you see them all mixed up, bull and cows traveling. Usually, the cows they travel first on their migration north, but now, uh, last few years, I've been noticing that bulls are coming first and. Uh, it's uh, changing quite a bit. Sometimes, uh, like last year, there was no caribou at all. Just a few cross crow flats. The rest stayed high on the mountains. And, and uh, the short was run. The run migration was short. Well, the caribou is declining now. It'll never recover, you know. I know that. Because I stay about a mile above Old Crow, that's just a mile from Old Crow. Last two years I see caribou crossing. In the spring, there's, there's about 300 caribou crossing that river in one bunch. And I, there was only four cows in the front. The rest is all yearlings. Scientists say climate change is happening around the world. In the northern Yukon, temperatures are expected to rise faster and higher than anywhere else in western North America. And we've already seen the signs. The permafrost is melting. Water systems are very low in some cases completely dry. Hunters like Georgie Moses are already struggling with the collapse of fish stocks, a basic staple of ours.
Salmon are declining very fast. He says it makes it hard for him to feed his dogs and sustain his way of life. Now we're having a hard time with getting fish and um, like the fisheries department, they shut us down from fishing. So I have no choice but to, to dig into my freezer again like and bring extra food. I can't depend on my net anymore. I only got two fish. A couple of days ago I had five, which was really good. Today I only got two, so it's getting lesser and lesser and I don't know what we're going to do. And they really stop us from fishing and and I have to beat the people too. You know, I, I was grow, brought up like that from my grandfather, so I have to share my food too. And looks like I can't share anything today. And three years ago, on June 7, 2007, our spring home for centuries, Zelma Lake, disappeared in just one day. The 20 kilometer square lake simply vanished when the banks around it melted away. It left nothing behind but cracked mud. Everything, the fish, the beavers, the muskrats are all gone now. This is going to change the entire ecosystems here. Um, usually, this is where we get caribou. Caribou usually come here. We don't even. We never even saw one set of tracks on Zelma Lake. This is where we get all our food, all the fish, muskrats, ducks, everything we get from this lake, and we have for um, for many. For many thousands of years, my ancestors have come here and um, and lived and survived from Zelma Lake, and it's it's gone now. It's it's so devastating. It's so sad. This is where we harvested a lot of our food: muskrats, rabbits, ptarmigan, ducks, caribou, everything we got from this lake, and it's it's gone. It's it's very sad. It's very devastating. What happened at Zalmo Lake wasn't a part of a scientific theory, something that can't be debated any longer. It's proof climate change is happening here and now. We have to let the world know what is happening. So we went to the steps of the Yukon Territorial Legislature to make our concerns known. All our foods are on a drastic decline. We're going to have a real issue of food insecurity and health pertaining to our people, especially indigenous peoples who live on the land. And I think it's time that you know people take this very seriously. This is very serious here. This is not only the eastern Arctic problem. This is a North Yukon or Yukon territorial problem as well. And we need to get some politicians to start doing something, to start planning forward, get some adaptation strategies with respect to food security here in the Yukon, and I think that's where we need to go, and that's why I'm here today. Okay, thank you. We have taken our message to the world. While we work on stopping the causes of climate change, we also have a lot of work to do at home. Our elders have warned us for years that hard times are coming. They said we have to start planning for long-term changes. We have to find food security. While we have to look at the new solutions, our elders also teach us that we have to remember what kept us alive in the past. The only way we're going to survive is to learn those skills, traditional skills, of our ancestors for the future. We can't live on white man food alone. We got to share what we have and look after it and take care of that caribou. You see, we can't go to the grocery store to get cheap foods. We are far from markets and everything must be flown in. It is very expensive to eat outside food. We have to find resources to feed ourselves. So, we held a symposium in January of 2009. Elders, youth, 
government and scientists met to talk about our land and our food. Mother Earth, we call Mother Earth because she gives us life. And just like our mother provides us with life and nurtures us. And I think that's the really the big goal here is that we want to make sure everybody in the com community understands what the issues are. Not just, you know this one little sliver of the problem, you know, and you know another sliver of the problem. Everybody as a whole group knows all of the problems and all of the challenges and hopefully can start finding some of the solutions. The youth were able to interact with researchers and hear from the elders sharing their traditional knowledge. Many people shared thoughtful wisdom and advice. This year, I only had to chop Martin for one month due to all the water and the overflow and all the air hole pockets in the lake. I had to pick up my chop early. So you can see what's going to happen when this elder talk about 10 to 20 years down the road, how it's going to be for you guys and what you guys will be facing. As our chief, Joe Linklater, says, we will have to work as united peoples around the circumpolar world to accomplish our goals. And all of the indigenous people uh, from the circumpolar north are facing the same uh, uh, issues and challenges that we are here in North Yukon. So I think the information that we can provide to the broader community um, would be helpful, but we also need to figure out how does this fit into uh, the research that they're doing uh, in Russia, and in the Sami country, uh, um, and uh, across uh, the, the Inuit uh, um, territories. But besides teaching and talking, some of our citizens are finding new ways to feed ourselves. Here, 150 kilometers above the Arctic Circle, the first experiments at farming and gardening are taking place. Actually, this is my first time raising turkeys. I had tried chickens before and geese that was about 10 years ago and so I'm just trying something new this year and it seems to be doing good. Teresa also has a garden where she produces a small vegetable crop. This is our first year growing here in Oprah and so I tried something and it, it grew pretty good so I was quite happy with the cabbages and broccoli, cauliflower, most of all, what, what I was really surprised with celery, because celery, you have to have warm climate for them, mm -hmm. and they're very hard to grow even in white horse. And it, I had no problem with it. Elder Stephen Frost also shows me his garden. This is uh, like spinach, I guess that's what it is. And this is because you could go, you could go here anywhere. Uh, I have potatoes here and there all over and down at my cabin I got a garden of potatoes there. There's quite a bit of it going on in town now and it's going to get better. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. um, this one is like, uh, you could just put a little bit in your tea. Man, oh man, look at that. Feel how strong you get when you eat that? This is sweet peas. I guess it's like flowers, huh? Flowers after a while. While we can try growing new things, real food security comes from knowing what is on the land that can sustain us. This is fall onions. And this is good to eat with fish, especially uh, salmon, and there's all kinds of food out here that you could live on, there's berries and plants. Well, we're here at Schaefer Creek and we're at the end of our travels, so we're getting ready to go and all our stuff is getting packed into the boats, so we're going to head on down Schaefer Creek go to Crow River and then we're gonna hit Porcupine River to Old Crow and that's where our destination is and that's where we're gonna go despite the changes 
we have had a successful hunt this year in the Crow Flats. You got your bag? Yeah. Did you like your Did you like your trip? Yeah, I like it, but mm, it's fun and good luck. Okay. A lot of hard work has meant we'll have enough food for our family this year, enough food to share. <laughs> the question is, how long will it last? You take only what you need and nothing more. You give back to the land. Always respect the land. Because if you don't, the land is going to take something from you and you might not like what it's going to take. We, the people of Old Crow, the Van Tat Kuchin, are doing our best to adapt. But change threatens to overwhelm us. How do you stop lakes from draining, fish from declining, and caribou from disappearing? Our experience now has to be told to the world. Change is here, now. It's coming to you, it's going to affect your community, your people, next. The youth are paying attention, the communities are paying attention, we need to act now.